Why do we work? It's a big question with a seemingly simple answer. We need to work so we can put food on the table, pay for rent, have health insurance. And as Americans, the only way we can do that is to have money. And the only way we can have money is if we work for it, whether we're subservient to someone else as an employee or have the ability and resources to be our own boss, at which point we don't really need to work at all. Even if we didn't need jobs, there are plenty of us who just enjoy working and staying busy with their hands, like those of us who enjoy making YouTube videos. But we need jobs, and unless we're lucky and privileged enough, we have to deal with some truly terrible ones. And these jobs are most likely in fields that we're not even slightly passionate about or skilled for, so we don't starve to death. As someone who has wanted to tear down and salvage fictional spaceships in zero gravity and has had plenty of terrible jobs, Heart Space Shipbreaker was a big deal. In this game, you work for Lynx, a massive interplanetary mega corporation with all the empathy of an Amazon or most any other Fortune 500 company. Because of the hazards of the work in the game's opening moments, you sign away your DNA, your most personal and unique trait, so that you can be cloned to continue your work and pay down your massive debt as an indentured servant seeking a future among the stars. I'm gonna let the cat out of the bag right now. I love this game. It has its share of flaws, of course, but it's so good, you should buy it twice. I bought it two and a half years ago when it was in its earliest early access days and I've been dying for it to hit 1.0 so I could finally do a review on it. And I realize it probably won't get a lot of views, but this game means a lot to me. My goal with this video isn't necessarily to convince you of how great it is, but to tell you why I love it so much and why it speaks to me. For this video, I interviewed my pal Jace, who you saw on this channel a few years back when we did the Anth Forum. Why Jace? Because a decade ago, I worked overnights at Walmart just to get by, and for a while there, he was my manager. What I'm also saying is I'm not going to try and get too existential or anything else like that, but what is it that drives you as a person, and what do you want to accomplish in your life, and what makes you happy? I also gathered up anecdotes from my Patreon supporters about crappy jobs they've had or the worst parts of the ones they have now. This game, this video, this review is a strange tribute to the awful work that we have to do just to get by, and I'm so, so happy to be able to make it, and I hope you enjoy it. So how does Hard Space Shipbreaker succeed in letting you break down virtual spacecraft while being a successful commentary on the nature of late-stage capitalism? Let's cut through it together. It may not be the first, but it is the nth review. Number 19 for Hard Space Shipbreaker, brought to you by my patrons at patreon.com slash the nth review. Success is not the key to happiness. Happiness is the key to success. If you love what you do, you will be successful. The Lynx employee handbook says that avoiding chatter makes profits fatter. It's not right what's happening. And from what I see, none of us are safe. We need to do something. The only way to truly fix a mistake is to not allow it to happen in the first place. What you're embarking on right now is the dream. I work as a janitor in a grocery store, and the worst part of my job is that if I'm on break and there's a spill or my manager needs something done, I have to stop my break and take care of it. That and olive oil spills. Romega, Patreon producer. Right after I finished my five-hour Thief series review way back in the first days of 2021, which you should check out, I was excited to talk about this game when it was still crawling out of the primordial ooze and had no campaign to speak of yet. So while I usually use the first chapter of this review to talk about where the game came from and the history of the developer, I've already done that. So go check out that video if you're interested in those fun details like the origin of its clunky title, which is the Benedict Cumberbatch of game names. I thought about cushioning the blow of a recommendation like that by saying it's less than 20 minutes long, but YouTube only seems to recommend my videos if they're at least an hour, so I think you'll be okay. Hard Space is what they call in the industry a double A game. 
which means it's not bleeding edge in any way. It didn't have a big budget, it's not a tentpole release, and it doesn't have a massive open world or whatever. It knows exactly what it wants to do and carves out a very satisfactory lane. Slotting in pretty well with fellow cynical anti-capitalist and double-A role-playing game, The Outer Worlds, which is another review you should check out. The difference between the two is that while this game has components that it doesn't quite flesh out, it doesn't collapse under the weight of its ambition like The Outer Worlds did. That said, you're the only person in your berth when you cut up ships. There's no AI, there are no enemies, and there is no multiplayer, even though the key art shows a cutter in the reflection of the visor of another cutter. The idea of being able to work with other people to salvage ships is the most badass thing ever, but it was technically too complex for the developers to pull off. Oh well. Of course, there are trade-offs that come with the game's scope that manifest as problems like tedium, which is something that we'll get into later. So who are you? Well, you're a new, nameless shipbreaker. Your supervisor calls you, generically, Cutter, and your employer designates you as Cutter 9346-52, or just 52 to your boss's bosses. 52? It's Hal. Let's talk. So yeah, you are yet another null protagonist where you project your own opinions, objectives, and ambitions upon the in-game character. And maybe it's Apologia? but for what this game does, I really think it works. What you do know is that you are yet another dreamer trying to flee the earth that we ruined to pursue the wild adventure of mankind's new colonies throughout the solar system. Lynx Corporation is happy to provide that ticket to the cosmos, but you'll be forced to work for them until you pay off your debt, company store and all. You have no ID. You can type in a name which is more for save file purposes than for the campaign, but your identity is little more than the voice track you pick to service the grunts and screams you make while cracking open ships. You can pick your dietary considerations too. I picked plastic free, but the chicken option was really appealing. There's no character customization, your face is a mirrored helmet, and you are, for the indefinite future, an indentured servant until you can pay for your rocket ride off of our ruined planet. Perhaps the most horrifying aspect of this whole thing is the contract you sign before you submit your virtual fingerprint to start your new job. The contract is long and specifies all kinds of crazy crap, and as a player, you are probably just as disinclined to read the whole thing as the end user license agreement of any random games launcher. By signing the contract, you cannot quit your job at any time. You are also required to submit yourself to Lynx's Everwork program so that you can be cloned in the event of your death, which becomes truly terrifying as the storyline reveals the truly malevolent things they can do to you. Of course, the number of ways you can die accidentally scared me away from the game's hardcore, no revival difficulty, where your first death is your last. But I don't know, I love this game, I'll probably do it anyway. You have no past, and your future, for the foreseeable future, is working shift after shift salvaging spacecraft to chip away at a seemingly insurmountable debt so you can eventually pursue a future in the cosmos. So who is your benevolent employer? I'm so glad you asked. The Lynx Corporation serves as the basis of, and but for, all of the game's snarky anti-capitalist commentary. It reminds you of this through detached, faux inspirational messaging. When Lynx has something in depth to present to you, it does so with all of the bravado of a corporate training video with scripted, entirely copacetic messaging from its ambivalent CEO. Hardspace's commentary on hyperlate stage capitalism isn't as cartoonish or overbearing as The Outer Worlds is, is which allows the realities of your work and the desperation of your situation to sit in. And this is where the parallels with entry-level work in the real world make this game insanely relatable. In this game, we never grasp how large this company is, except that it regularly uses its massive, unknowable size as an appeal to its own authority. Because it was allowed to become this large, because it can so effortlessly convince you to sign away your life, and because your title role and toolset are so clearly defined, Lynx's authority must be proper and legitimate. As you float through your workspace, the massive structures of Lynx's salvage division loom large in the background, part of a small sliver of some incredible greater whole. As you kick off your new career, the introductory cutscene is appealing in a blandly corporate way with bright synthy music, 
charming colors, and plenty of self-congratulatory platitudes about their broad humanitarian goals. But this is definitely a company that gives charitably as a tax obligation and otherwise enriches its wealthy shareholders. If you've made it this far down the Lynx employment funnel, you're probably wondering, what do your new digs look like? Well, they look a lot like this. Your new home is the HAB, which is by all weights and measures solitary confinement. You live here alone in this notch, in this station above the earth. Yes, half the space is taken up by space gear, but who cares? You can customize it with posters that you salvage along the way. Way back in early access, the HAB was a simple menu, but for the final game, they built it out to a node-based space that you have to navigate to conduct any of your business via two entire computers, like upgrading your equipment, reading emails, and, well, pretty much just those. Everything else is pretty superfluous. Thankfully, the UI gives you a long press at any point to start your shift. The HAB now feels like an early 90s FMV game, and, you know, it's not bad, it's just... There. It has more personality than the old menu pane. One thing that always kind of confused me was the Master Jack, which is that big thing in the berth where you conclude your shift. I mean, it's got a window on it, so I thought you lived inside that. But that's not true, because obviously your future spaceship isn't floating just outside the Master Jack. I mean, that makes sense, sure, but do you have to then spacewalk over to the actual hab from the Master Jack before and after shifts? Seems like the lore got lost somewhere in between there. Let's go ahead and talk about that Master Jack though, because it's an important location for oxygen, thruster fuel, and other replenishable supplies. If you run out of oxygen, you die. Makes sense. If you run out of thruster fuel, you have to then try and grapple yourself around the berth so that you can buy more fuel. I never successfully did this because when you ran out of fuel in this Newtonian space hell, your brakes don't work either, so don't let this run out. The cool part, especially early on before you've invested many points in upgrades, is that you can find these supplies in the ships themselves. This means that the rush to get out of a very tight space inside a ship so you don't die of oxygen deprivation isn't as extreme sometimes. Even if you have watched my original hard space video, I'm gonna mention it again, I would love a Lego mock or a die-cast model of the Master Jack. I think it's so freaking cool. So what do you actually do in this game? I've had students throw up and pee in my room. I've had to teach while they're carrying a kicking and profanity screaming child down the hall. I learned how to train for an active shooter scenario while social distancing due to COVID. James Wyatt, Patreon Assistant Producer. Your job at Lynx Corporation in their salvage division, way, way down on the totem pole, is to strip down spaceships towed in from the cosmos, 15 minute shifts at a time, shift after shift, down into their base components. Each ship is rated and broken down into salvage goals based on its size, contents, and construction, and you have to dismantle each one to progress as a player and as a worker. Properly salvaged components tossed into the right collectors boost your score and allow you to achieve those salvage goals. In turn, those salvage goals allow you to acquire currency, which lets you advance the game. Inversely, if you damage stuff, blow up critical components, let ship reactors melt down, or just keep tossing junk into the wrong collectors, you can work yourself into a position where you're basically paying to do your crappy job while your advancement milestones stay far away. Hard Space rewards you with three different currencies. The first are Mastery Points. You acquire these to reach new certification levels which advance the story, unlock equipment upgrades, and present progressively difficult challenges. You get access to bigger, more fruitful ships, but you're also exposed to greater, deadlier dangers. These certification milestones also serve as the chain that pulls the story along, so you'll usually experience new narrative revelations as you reach new ranks. The second currency is Lynx Tokens. You can acquire these via salvage goals, but they allow you to purchase those tools and equipment upgrades you unlocked with your certification rankings. We'll get a little more granular about this in a bit. And then finally, there's money, which is 
completely ducking useless. It's not useless in the sense that hard space is trying to cram post-capitalist doctrine down your throat, but in the sense that your expenditures amount to essentially nothing in the enormousness of your debt to links. You can only spend money on refillables like your survival necessities, demo charges, repair kits, and tethers. Despite their price tags, they may as well cost nothing. Money in this game is more of a tool of abuse, a constant psychological reminder of how truly subservient you are. Each shift tallies up your dues to remind you of how little progress you make with each shift, even if you've unlocked all the game ships and maxed out all of your tools. You have to pay to work every single shift, which the game constantly reminds you of, which goads you into being profitable with effective salvage each shift, or with each ship altogether. You can purchase your equipment to avoid paying some of those fees, but by the time this is possible, the story is probably wrapping up for you anyway. Don't buy your equipment, is what I'm saying. As I touched on earlier, the most severe aspect of this job is the fact that you can die. Pull a computer desk too quickly, dead. Fall onto a furnace or processor, definitely dead. Random thing that happened that you can't account for, probably dead. The game's difficulties don't tweak vast fields of variables regarding laser or material strengths, but rather how often you can die before you run out of Everwork clones. Oh, and Lynx reminds you that you're on the hook for the cost of these clones too. Since I already had a save file with the unlimited clones option, this review relied on a 30 clone limit. And I tell you what, I was pretty scared about whether I'd be able to finish the game since I didn't know the full length of the campaign and what dangers lie in waiting or how careless I would ultimately be in the birth. There was a mackerel I was really sloppy on where I died twice. But in the end, I only wound up using about eight of these clones, leaving me plenty of spares for post-finale shenanigans. One of Lynx's many charities <coughs> is that you get your own dedicated berth at Morgan Station orbiting Earth. This means that you can spend as long as you want breaking down spacecraft without having to worry about a coworker coming in and screwing something up. Of course, don't take too long. Time is money, and those usage fees pile up pretty quick. Just a fun little side note before we get into your workspace, it's actually kind of a trippy thing to work on the ship across multiple shifts, because the game saves the exact state of your workspace as you leave it. This means you can come out of the hab at the beginning of the next shift and find tethers tethering still, and things happening as if you had never left. It's weird, it's small, but anyway. As you may have surmised from the name of the game, or all of the footage you've seen so far, or everything I've described, this game takes place in space, and it is completely unapologetic about that fact. For some, it may truly be too hard a space. <laughs> Here in your berth, you have full three-dimensional six degrees of freedom mobility to move, strafe, yaw, pitch, and roll in and around. You are at the mercy of the game's Newtonian physics, which means it's very easy for you to smack into things, have things smack into you, or to send parts into the abyss with your grapple's push mechanic. Yes, I've spent plenty of time trying to save those would-be orphans, but some are just lost to the void. Just let them be. This means that as you hack down the mass of your ship, it's easy for it to start moving around, potentially winding up getting caught in the intense gravity wells of the various collectors you don't want it to, or putting you in harm's way until you can tether it back to a safer, more central position again. I typically use a controller anyway, but the two-stick setup for this game is incredible. I played it with a controller on PC originally, but also obviously for the Xbox Series S version for review. The lack of accuracy be damned, something that definitely makes precise work more of a pain, I have no idea why you'd play this with keyboard and mouse when most of the control required is rolling and thrusting around. Of course, all of this space freedom can lead to disorientation, especially as you're inside a ship while it's rotating or you're rotating. Thankfully, the berth has furnaces and processors on both sides with a huge green barge on another, prominently featured, so you're rarely truly lost. I never got motion sickness from this arrangement, but I assume a childhood playing X-Wing and TIE Fighter helped with that. Your berth is narrow, long, and tall. It keeps the action confined, but it also means that larger ships just wind up just a bit longer. Working on javelins and atlases can be a pain with big nanocarbon sections that have to be carefully maneuvered away from the stern and toward the processors in the mid-berth. 
We're going to talk about the ships themselves more in depth later, but you'll quickly realize that they're all permutations of a base construction set. Each ship will typically have some external electronics that can be tossed into the barge, and nanocarbon cladding that can be sent to the processors. Each ship is double-hulled. The outer hull is a tough and heavy nanocarbon shell that you can only break down with demo charges or by cutting playfully bright and helpful connector points. You toss those sections bit by bit into the blue processor wells. The outer hull is connected to an internal, lightweight aluminum inner hull with more of those extremely helpful connector points which can be tossed into the furnace and remelted into, you know, whatever. Toothpicks, fancy bows, cooking pans. I don't know what the future needs. Sandwiched tightly between the two hulls are your coolant tanks, fuel cans, thrusters, and precarious fusion reactors. Those get tossed into the barge as well. At a ship's gooey core within the confines of its inner hull are all of the crew accommodations, chairs, atmospheric regulators, power systems, storage electronics, posters, bunnies, and other collectibles. Those all go in the barge too. If you ever need help, the UI is more than happy to let you know where they need to be deposited because the wrong thing in the wrong place can sabotage your salvage goals. Floating toward the open end of your berth are large immovable jacks, including the master jack. I don't know how they're removable unless they're just absolutely infinitely massive, but they don't have any apparent propulsion systems keeping them in place. This game makes you think about stuff. What can I say? You can tether ship components to these fixtures to move them out of the way or to prevent them from potentially drifting into the wrong bins. They're especially useful for larger chunks of ships since the furnaces are positioned at the rear of the ships and the processors up front. Definitely helpful for bigger, longer ships. And then, of course, in the middle of this circus is your ship itself, the puzzle box you must unfurl with your special tools. The tiny mackerels you start with are a welcome retreat, giving you plenty of elbow room, while javelins and geckos will get you thinking on your space feet about how best to manage their massive hulls. But let's talk about the presentation for a bit, because this is clearly a product of old relic veterans in charge of bringing homeworld to the universe. You can tell because the vessels rely on simple polygonal constructions, bright colors, extremely detailed grayscale concept sketches, and plenty of talking heads beside text boxes. Presentation is sharp, evocative of that post-Star Trek science fiction glamour I keep talking about. Stuff that penetrates games like System Shock 2 or 2017's Prey. It hits that nostalgic sweet spot without looking old or antiquated. Technically, the game is nothing mind-blowing on the visual front. The textures get chonky sometimes, but there are some fun bloom effects around cooling cabinets or the occasional haunting atmosphere before you depressurize the thing. The game saves its horsepower for when you start carving up stuff and create new parts from other parts. It can get very messy, especially as the physics get involved. In fact, it's pretty ridiculous how messy these scenes can get if you're not tossing away stuff as you work on it or you're being particularly sloppy or having way too much fun. Dropping a demo charge next to a ship's still live reactor and then blowing it up is a great way to watch a ship shred itself to bits or crash the game, although that might have been because I had the game in quick resume for a few days. The game does struggle as the calculations add up, hitching and pausing during some cataclysmic events that were definitely not my fault, but I think the trade-offs to get there are probably worth it. They also help build and enforce the game's solitary, claustrophobic environment. And while the graphics may not blow minds, the sound absolutely will. There are lots of space-based effects and synthesis that make this game immersive. One of my favorite effects is the deep distortion of your grappler as it struggles to move more massive objects. There are tons of awesome stingers and plenty of appropriate alarms as things get scary to remind you to stay alive. The typical field music is of the twangy country variety, and me just putting those words into the atmosphere may offend some sensibilities, but it is truly soothing as you're working. It's so effective in this game that Lynx recommends it as a means to boost productivity among its workers. So you know, there's that. But then the bass drops when things get dangerous, especially when dealing with a ship's reactor. You detach that thing from its cradle, or clip its coolant prematurely, and it starts melting down. The guitar pluckings go away, and you are now riding a sinister synthwave until the matter is resolved 
for better or worse. You also get the fun experience of your character struggling to breathe as you run out of oxygen, or the ominous XCOM-esque music when navigating AI-infested spaceships. The tempo picks up when things happen, and strangely, other times when they don't. In the game's earliest days, it had no issue tossing the kitchen sink at you. You were disassembling pressurized hazardous ships relatively quick. This made the final game easier to get into as a long-time player, but the more iterative, slower tutorial that breaks down the learning process over a larger number of ranks and training sessions can feel pedantic for a hard space veteran like me. Of course, you probably won't notice a thing coming to it fresh. There are a lot of things to learn here beyond moving around effectively in three dimensions. As you add skills to your toolset, you begin to feel equipped to genuinely handle any complex task a ship can give you. We'll come back to the hazards later. On a random note, there are more objects early on in this game that you can't interact with that will eventually serve a narrative purpose. But there are some that never do, like this first-gen Xbox 360 hard drive looking thing. You don't have a number row full of tools at hand, which is great because the three-prong radial wheel works great to provide you with a few extremely powerful salvage instruments. Each one of your tools has multiple applications, and you'll quickly fall in love with all of them. The grappler is your pusher and puller. It's how you move things around. It lets you lug stuff around, yank stuff out, push components into the collection bins, especially big stuff, or whip smaller stuff away to incredible satisfaction. When you're tugging stuff around, you will quickly realize how massive individual components are. Nanocarbon is heavy and dense. Aluminum is light. Power generators are heavy. Chairs are practically feathers. You'll also use the grappler to yank stuff off of hulls, like computers, lights, airlock consoles, or antenna, which requires some patience. Or, if you've got a lot of stuff to remove, a lot of patience. You'll rely on the grappler's push and then the super push upgrade to get stuff out of the way, especially those big nanocarbon hull panels. There's an incredible joy in lining up behind stuff and pushing it like a cue slamming into a pool ball into a collector. It's so good. When pushing stuff around isn't good enough, the game gives you tethers. You pick one thing and then another thing and they'll gradually draw themselves together. Or you can tether one end to an object and the other end to a collector and see those components get towed away like magic. If you've got a particularly massive thing that you need to move, you can use multiple tethers to draw stuff to its destination. Of course, until you start tossing enough Lynx tokens at the grappler, you'll have to deal with not having enough tethers in your quiver at a time or having your tethers expire too quickly, requiring you to re-tether stuff to move it around. You can chain tether items to each other and then tether those into a collector, but the reality isn't nearly as romantic as the intro cinematic would lead you to believe. What would otherwise be a signature move not working very well is a bummer, but it also seems like a matter of balance. It takes a long time before your tethers can get strong enough or last long enough to be that effective. If daisy chaining worked well, it would make your individual powers probably far too powerful from the get-go. Your next tool is the cutter. If the grappler is your left hand, the cutter is your right. This is your weapon to break ships apart, and it has two modes, the laser and the split saw. The laser is a precision high energy ray that allows you to destroy individual components. It's slow, but it's clean. This helps when separating hulls without a lot of messy collateral, or when trying to separate stuff from other stuff, like this radiation filter from its container. It's great when you're working on cut points in inner hulls, and when you don't want to make a mess. On the other hand, the split saw is your big messy fire stick. You can orient it vertically or horizontally, and it'll slice through whatever you give it, shy of nanocarbon. It lets you fruit ninja stuff or break big chunks of aluminum into much smaller ones. It's not as precise as the laser, but it's your chainsaw. One of the most fun things I did in this game was carve through huge chunks of aluminum hull with the split saw because it was too big for the furnace. Seriously, it's like a hot knife through butter. Thankfully, you'll rarely need to use the split saw to cut aluminum from nanocarbon. Most of the time they're connected by easily eliminated cut points. But it's the split saw's messiness that makes it so valuable when you need to improvise. Like when you need to cut a hole in an aluminum floor to toss stuff out of a ship quickly, rather than tunnel your way back out of your ship as it's designed. 
Where the split saw is actually incredibly effective is with those cut points, especially ones that are right next to each other. The game has a cool mechanic where if you're close enough to a cut point, the split saw will destroy it without damaging anything around it. But sometimes when you least suspect it, the split saw blast will clip something nearby and cause a huge damn mess. Or turn you into a mess. A dead mess. And it happens so quickly and easily that you'll second guess your use of it around critical equipment. Or not. One frustrating part of the cutter tool is actually something inherent to video games, and that is the fact that your on-screen tool doesn't match the geometry and action of the actual tool. This is particularly noticeable in tight spaces when your cutter clips through a surface and would realistically probably cause a bunch of extra damage if you pulled the trigger. But when you pull that trigger, it doesn't. There's a disconnect between what you see and what you get. A trick I learned in early access is that even if it doesn't look like your cutter will cut the right thing, so long as the reticle is accurate, you'll be good. Well, like 95% of the time. Your last in-hand tools are your demo charges. These aren't as vital to your moment-to-moment -moment operation as the other tools. In fact, the game didn't introduce it until something like halfway through my playtime, because you'll only use them to break up bigger ships, or to destroy the game's toughest cut points, which are also on the bigger ships. My favorite use for them is when you've got an inner hull lying around and you need to break it down for the furnace, but the split saw is too messy and time consuming. There are a few joys quite like setting up a chain of explosive charges, pulling back, whipping out your detonator trigger, and letting them rip. Every time. It's amazing. Finally, you have a scanner overlay that allows you to keep tabs on what's going on. Your most basic material scanner lets you easily see what stuff goes where. Blue stuff goes in the blue collector, orange stuff goes in the orange furnace. Cut points show up in bright yellow, and most importantly, you can see through ships to orient yourself. Advanced scanners let you see specific systems, so you know where pickups are or where reactor coolant lines go. When you think you've disposed of a ship entirely, the scanner lets you quickly see if anything else of value is still around. As I've already touched on, tool upgrades with Lynx tokens are very important. They give you more capacity, more tolerance, more durability, and more efficiency. Beyond your tools, you can upgrade your helmet for those higher-end scanners, upgrade your suit's oxygen supply, and increase your resistance to various hazards. There's plenty to dump points into, and you'll want to stay on top of your upgrade screen to make sure you're making your job as easy as possible. You'll also need to maintain your tools and outright fix them if you've let them degrade too far. This is an interesting mechanic, but a little frustrating because you buy repair kits while you're in the berth and repair them when you're in the hab. You can't do both at the same time. It's weird. Now we get to the actual ships of Hard Space Shipbreaker. Something you'll encounter as you play is the sheer variety of craft, despite the fact that there are only really four archetypes. The smaller Mackerel, the longer Javelin and Atlas, and the massive Gecko. But a chunk of each vessel is modular and randomly configured. Some mackerels have two engines, others four. Some geckos are designed for passenger travel, others are full of cargo. It makes each ship a unique challenge, while also being familiar enough that you can hack through the broad stuff relatively quick. Ships can offer complex systems or structures that can be difficult to untangle. You'll also uncover different liveries. Before they fell into your berth, these ships had previous lives, doing what they were designed and built for by companies for companies. I wish the game embellished a little more on what those other big companies were, because the construction and configuration of these vessels allows for a lot of environmental storytelling. Maybe not quite enough. The game kicks off with depressurized ships. You can float in and around and out of them without penalty. But then the game introduces pressurized ships that still have atmospheres for their former crew and passengers. You'll enter through airlocks and cycle air in and out. These ships even have separate pressurized chambers, and your scanner can tell you which rooms still have atmospheres so you don't run into trouble. You can actually soak up oxygen while in these pressurized environments so that you don't have to rely on your own supply, which is a bigger deal earlier on when you haven't applied many upgrades. But you must eventually let the cat out of the bag, or the air out of the ship, and you have exactly one way to do that without some possibility of explosive decompression, with a system of working atmospheric regulators to slowly deflate the ship. 
but sometimes making all the right moves doesn't result in an easy win because not all of these atmospheric regulators are functional. Like Minesweeper, sometimes you have to take a leap of faith to get ahead. Decompression can hurt you, but it can definitely kill you. Lancing ships in any unexpected way can cause this to happen, and you may find yourself surprised by this when you're working inside ships. Heaven forbid something you weren't keeping track of blows up and the ship decompresses surprisingly. Decompression is fun until it's not, and it's the first thing you'll have to resolve when working on any ship. Between each ship's two hulls is that crawl space we talked about earlier. Navigating to it is the next big thing you'll want to do after ensuring the ship is safely decompressed. It's in this space where you'll zap cut points to separate the two hulls, granting you access to salvage all of the ship's gooey innards. Hmm. That sounds a lot less delicious now that I've said it out loud. While there are plenty of tight, wafer-thin crawl spaces, there are also plenty of vacuous chambers in here that might seem strange for a spacecraft to have. And bear in mind, these crawl spaces are also pressurized, so the designers built these huge pressurized bubbles around the inner hulls of bigger ships for reasons that can't be explained by any fictional means, especially around reactors and engines. Instead, we as gamers must remember that this is a work of fiction, and also a video game, with the goal of being fun, first and foremost. One of the most fun aspects of this game is learning the ships, and Hard Space offers puzzles along the way. Not puzzles in the sense of obscurity or difficulty, or in some discrete sense, but puzzles in having to figure out how to dismantle stuff. There's plenty of predictability once you get used to how these archetypes are laid out, but until then, you have to figure out how all of these little edge cases and bespoke components come apart. There are lots of complex intertwined components and compartments here, especially in the bigger ships. Like, here's this javelin mid-hull system that you have to detangle and hopefully not cause any terrible explosions. Or hey, look at the javelin's massive nanocarbon panels that you have to decouple from the inner hull. Or what about the javelins altogether? They're just complex ships. Sometimes just retrieving fuses can be a fun little distraction. The scanner gives you a leg up if you remember to use it. The toughest puzzle in my experience was figuring out how to disassemble Atlas engines, which I'm going to spoil now to prove a point. Each nacelle is a live hazard with fuel flowing to the engine in the rear, except the shutoff valve is deep inside the nanocarbon casing, only accessible by removing the engine, which involves starting some fires. So first off, you have to pull off the nacelle's protector caps, and then slice the cut points to remove the rear thruster cone. Then you tether the stationary engine to the rear wall for a reason that will make sense in a second. The engine has four fuel lines that have to be cut to free it. I play with a controller, but this is one instance where you genuinely need some precision because the cut points are so small. I goofed at least once trying to quickly cut them with my split saw and blew up the engine too. As you cut each fuel line, it begins a flaming chain reaction that goes back to the fuel can deep inside the nacelle. If you can't resolve this quickly enough, it blows up. Things blowing up is bad. You have to quickly cut these four lines, at which point the engine is free, and because you've tethered it, the engine flies out. Now you have to fly into the flaming maelstrom inside, race to the back, and flip the switch to cut the fuel supply. And then you're good, and the nacelle splits apart for you to salvage. On more advanced Atlas variants, the ship will have obstacles you have to navigate to reach the fuel switch because, of course, hopefully you remember you've got an engine hanging out against that back wall that needs to go to the barge. Unfortunately, you may have to repeat this one or two more times on that ship. It gets awfully repetitive. The toughest mental puzzle, however, might be not keeping track of time and tackling a big disassembly like that right as your shift ends. Be careful with that unless you can magically race back to position from the hab to prevent an explosion that will happen if, say, those nacelle fires reach the fuel can. Randomly, there's this very puzzling thing where you can find open doors floating in space. Is it a feature? Is it a bug? Who knows? As you've probably already realized, Decompression isn't the only hazard you'll encounter with these ships as you work with them. Reactors begin to melt down as soon as you decouple them. Electronic components can shock you, fiery components will burn you, and then probably blow up. Cracked open coolant will freeze you in your suit for a time. 
Your suit has a health meter and you will die if it gets too damaged. When reactors go critical and you haven't done enough to clear a path for them to reach the barge, they will destroy so, so much and you will lose a lot of salvage points. If you do something wrong, like clip a reactor coolant line a little too soon, your AI assistant immediately chides you to revisit your training. The game thankfully brings you up to speed with each type of hazard. Logically, the best and pretty much only way to deal with any of these dangers is to not let them happen in the first place. Being sloppy with your split saw or forgetting some critical bits of your training can cause all kinds of collateral damage or initiate any number of cascading disasters. There's a risk reward system going on working through a ship quickly, but one wrong move can cause a ton of havoc. But one of my favorite parts of this game is that it incentivizes not save scumming, which is something I rely on in so many other games when the smallest mistake can cause the biggest mess. With Hard Space, I was incentivized to just keep going and only in the absolute worst cases did I abandon the ship, which carries no real penalty to you since it's just money lost in the end. Why bother mopping up shards of shattered spaceship when you can just start over and hopefully make better decisions with a new ship? Instead, this game, doing business as the Lynx Corporation, inspires you to make the best of each ship. In early access, the game employed work orders which randomized which components it really wanted, but the final game moves them to a separate mode. Instead, your goal is to effectively salvage the whole ship and do so effectively. This reduces the penalties of failure, but it can also lead to tedium. Split sawing doors to decompress ships is effective, but Lynx doesn't like it. Oh well, who cares, you're basically the boss here. The true penalty is death, and that's only to the extent that the difficulty setting calls for. Hard Space encourages you to just keep on trucking after you make a bad mistake, and that felt pretty good, honestly. You can actually make a ton of mistakes here, and Lynx won't really care. You'll be frustrated at your lack of progress and probably uninstall the game, but this is not a difficult game. So if this is your bag to begin with, nothing ever truly sets you back. Be sure to stay tuned to the very end of this video after I've thanked my patrons and talked about the next video for my top 10 hard space shipbreaker tips that'll help you in your salvaging because I've played a lot of this game at this point. So stay tuned. I'll take this moment right now to ask you to like and subscribe if you haven't already and hit the bell and you know how all that works. Join Discord. It's great. We're great. Everything's great, which is an incredible segue to our next chapter. I worked in a warehouse in shipping and inventory and we were told to our faces that if we left they would just hire someone else because anyone could do our jobs. Also had the owner complain about the VIP packages and being not as great for a festival around us who were living paycheck to paycheck and could barely afford basic tickets to that kind of event. The warehouse had no AC and only maybe heat. So on really hot days, our manager would send us home early once we got stuff shipped and the owner and upper management would complain. Bolty Hound, Patreon Associate Producer. It's a testament to how fun this game is that I was willing to invest over 50 hours into it before it had a storyline or other characters beyond your supervisor guide in the tutorial. Back in the game's early access days, once they dumped all the mechanics on you, you just played. They offered a bunch of ships, too many ships I argued in my original video, and you just salvaged them one after the other. You got all your tokens and points and money, but there wasn't much of a compelling reason to do it beyond maxing out your character with the skills and abilities that they built out to that point. You were just nibbling away at your debt to links. I think I got a third of the way there back then, but I know some fanatics managed to pay it off. As they updated the game, they'd add a ton of content, like new ships, and they installed the story, act by act. It was very tempting to play through each section as they landed, especially since big updates often reset your progress. But I didn't want to grow old and tired of the game before it reached 1.0, so I stopped playing after they dropped the first act of the campaign. It's why I don't play a lot of games before they're released. I want to see the designer's full intentions before I'm tired of playing with it. You, Cutter52, work alone as part of a remote team. You hear from your teammates, Lou, Dee Dee, and Kai, over the radio, and in some cases, over email. You also have your supervisor, Weaver, who helps you learn the ropes and supports you along the way. He's not in the field like you and your crewmates are. He's worn out and behind a console somewhere, 
but he understands your plight because he was out there too. The game employs mostly small-time actors and their performances are about as memorable as their screen time. But one exception was Weaver's voice actor, Aaron Douglas, who did time in my original nth review for Watch Dogs as its most interesting character, Jordy. I still kind of wish they'd given him a game because he was so much cooler than Aiden was. We could just do that. Do that. When the conversation about unionization bubbles up among your crew in response to how genuinely inhumane the Lynx Corporation is and how dangerous your work is, Lynx sends down an administrator to watch over you, Hal Rhodes. His job is to boost your efficiency, quash any of that union jibber-jabber while piping in bad advice and quoting ghost-written platitudes by your bosses at the highest levels. He's a useless middle manager, basically. It's an interesting dynamic of the manager to store manager. And your job is to, at the end of the day, ideally push metrics and get results. Yeah, It is a results driven job. And that's what I always tell people. If you cannot handle getting results, do not work retail. But despite the union panic in here, the union that Lou speaks about is vaguely defined. It exists somewhere, but is it a cutter's union? What is its name? Do they have representatives? Is it legal? If so, how do they exist without Lynx tapping them out of existence? How are they organized? How can you petition to join them? It relies on some vague idea of what a union is and that it protects workers in an abstract way, but that's all you get here. Apparently few people made it terribly far into the campaign considering the low single digit achievement unlock rates as you progress. Since the story came late in development, there's basically zero alterations in the gameplay loop as you play. With the exception of the quote-unquote final mission, you play the game 15 minute shift by 15 minute shift until you get the second final ending. All of the narrative action happens off camera with the radio play-esque exposition you encounter on the job, in missions, or via email or motion comics back in the hab. Sometimes, however, text blocks will glitch out and not appear when people speak, which was a bit distracting since it's the only real way the game conveys what's going on. You have no interaction with your crewmates. The story advances as you achieve new certification ranks and start new shifts. Because of this format, the characterization of your crewmates is limited. I know the fight isn't for everyone, but I grew up with it. I spent more time shaking off station security than playing with friends. <laughs> there are tales of how the job used to be before new tools and technology came into the field, which rhymes so much with my own years of experience working in retail. Alongside the emails from Lynx, you can harvest hard drives from the field that come with audio logs and other narrative chunks. These fill in some background and highlight some affairs of the solar system, but not in a terribly compelling way. It reminds me a lot of all the literature you can find in an Elder Scrolls game, which seems to tap some infinite supply of words. The background literature here feels like homework or reference rather than something organic and interesting. The terrifying aspect of this game, one that it doesn't quite develop, is this idea of zeros and ones. Fresh in the field, you are a one, a stable unit to accomplish work. But human bodies didn't evolve for the vacuum of space for long periods of time, much less the hazards of this vigorous work. So eventually you degrade and become a zero. There are horrifying implications here, that you could effectively ruin your body to the extent that you can no longer do the work and then never pay off your debt to travel among the stars. But again, the game doesn't develop this. Early on, Weaver gives you a ship, once the transport of his dreams. He's not going to make it anywhere except back down to the new shorelines of Earth, so you may as well have it. This eventually becomes your lifeboat, your way to escape this life. The game is very big in scale and dramatic despite the lack of characterization and its very solitary gameplay. One of the most sinister parts of this job is the limited amount of freedom that Lynx gives you to do your job and pick your own ships and work within your own space. It's kind of like being a gig worker getting to set their own hours, but then having to settle with lack of protections and the constant tension of needing to work more to just get by. Again, Lynx doesn't penalize you for screwing up, so when you do, the penalty is self-inflicted 
inflicted and financial, really. The true price of this terrible job is mitigated somewhat by the fact that you seem to only work 15 minutes a day, but this isn't something that the game rubs in your face. It's the subtleties here in hard space, through your passive interactions with your crewmates, through Lynx's passive-aggressive messaging, that echoes through to any real-world experience you have with awful jobs and bad companies. As you get into the game, it feels very much like a criticism of contemporary wage slavery. It reminded me a lot of my own job. It's reminded me of, well, almost all my jobs. I want to make this a bit more personal now for a little bit. There's no easy way for me to say this, so I'll just say it. My resume, after 23 years in the workforce, is almost entirely useless. I've talked about a chunk of this in my Best Buy video, but I started working at age 16, and I stayed in retail for a decade. I went from retail to call center to retail to call center to retail to yet another call center to a set of different warehouse jobs, and all of that is effectively useless for moving up in the world. My resume is filled to the brim with entry-level work that doesn't amount to anything, and I've never made much money. You know, boohoo and all that. But there are a pair of exceptions. In 2013, I moved to Phoenix to serve as a full-time writer and video editor on a site my friends and I put together, Fleshening Zipper. It folded after a few months, and well, that's its own ball of wax. The other exception is what I'm doing now as a full-time reporter for a local paper. How I got that job is the result of seemingly wandering the desert endlessly. Virtually everything I learned about video production is self-taught. Everything that you're watching now, everything that you're hearing now, I had to learn slowly over the course of decades, despite a few months in art school right after I got out of high school. I've written novels, I shot a documentary, I've done so many things under the sun just to be able to scratch into a job where I could make a living being creative. I started this channel over eight years ago, and I still don't make anywhere near a living on it. None of my dreams had really worked out until last year. Between the reporting I did at our site a decade ago, writing about tech companies, and the scripts I wrote for these reviews, I was able to get a job as a reporter when I'd never gone to college for it. It was because of the short films I made with friends and the late aughts and the work I did with Fleshing Zipper and my proto-reviews and then my reviews here, learning video production, that I was able to produce podcasts professionally. I meet new and important figures in my city every single week now. It's amazing. I no longer feel like I have to rush home and work on videos like this to feel validated creatively or as a human being. But when Flesh Eating Zipper didn't work out in 2013, my options for work weren't great. I applied to work with my friend downtown and write shitty tech articles for your grandparents. I didn't pass the screening test, which honestly, thank God. I couldn't even get a job at the Walgreens on the block, but I did ultimately land a job at my local Walmart, stocking overnight. I have plenty of experience with some truly awful entry-level jobs, but None was as inhumane or objectified me as a productive commodity like Walmart did. It was depressing to have to slink back into retail work when I was just doing the work that I loved, but I had to do it. My pay was trash, and then the company would slash my hours on a whim. But what could I do? If I wanted to quit Walmart, it would have been a monumental task to find anything beyond warehouse work or retail work in Phoenix's Western Valley. And a company like Walmart agrees. Nobody forced you to take that job. Nobody said you have to take this job. You chose to take that job. And if you didn't like that job, you can leave and find a different job. And yes, I know that the job market can be hard and especially it's difficult. around there. <laughs> like my for God. sure. There were right. definitely lots of people that came to Walmart because they didn't have other options. They couldn't, and Walmart is not helping them grow into an opportunity where they could do something else or have the flexibility, especially if they are getting their hours cut in half next week. Sure. I can't go into this without going into the idea that we all make choices in life. Yeah. And those choices dictate where we are in life. And what choices did you make to put you into that position where you're working somewhere you don't want to work? 
As you begin Heart Space, these choices have already been made for you. You decide not to accept the offer to sign your life away and work at Lynx by quitting the game. Your character could just stay on Earth, hypothetically, but you don't have a choice here except to leave the game. In the real world, you can't make that choice. You can't just not work without a cushy pile of money to support you. So in this game, you have to sign with Lynx to progress. We can look back at all kinds of decisions we make to bring us into our current positions in life, for better and worse, but there are many things we can't control, and those are what we call luck. I could have done so many different things over the past 23 years, but none of them involved what I actually wanted to do. How many times did I apply for design or editing or writing positions and I was never good enough to get an email back, much less an interview? Could I have gone back and gotten my degree here for this or that? Sh sure, but... For what? I had so many choices, all of which would have landed me even more in debt than I already was. I look back now and I have no idea what I would have done or could have done differently to land me closer to the trajectory that I really wanted to be on from a young age, to make films. That allows me to empathize with the people who made working those miserable jobs worth it, and those were the co-workers who were deep in the same situation that I was. I really related to Kai in this game. He's klutzy, he's slow, he means well, and he screws things up. I'm the same way. In these entry-level jobs where time is money, I was never fast. I made a lot of stupid mistakes. I was bored at my job a lot, which meant I wasn't focusing on uncasing my 50 boxes an hour or ensuring on-demand online orders were picked up as quickly as possible. I was in my own world just trying to cope with the tedium. I spent a lot of time dreaming up and writing sections of novels in my head, then going home and writing them. I'd write some of my earliest reviews in my head while stocking dog leashes or laser lining shelf after shelf of candle wax scents, a lot of which were broken open so people could sample them. But then there's the point Jace brought up. And then I would probably push back with you on the ideal of, is that a forever job? Some people it is. So someone it like is, you, yeah. but someone like you, that wasn't your forever job. Sure. So you go into it at, with a different mentality and a different ideal than others because you know you're going to do better and do something else with your life. Other people may not have that same kind of ideal. They're just there to do their job, make money, go home, and that's it, man. And that's their life. Kai, like 52, like Lou, and all the others in the Link Salvage Division, and probably the whole company, are there because they can't go anywhere else. They can't do anything else. And you shouldn't have to be some ambitious Steve Jobs like to earn a living wage, access economic mobility, or work in a place that treats you with dignity. We should be proud as a country of our ability to live in a city and have respectable workplaces, accessible colleges, and additional education without the inhumanity or the impossibly large debt. You should be able to work every day of your life folding clothes or cleaning toilets if you want, but you shouldn't have to worry about whether you can put food on the plate back home. Capitalism just drives so much of like the depression and the mental health and the sadness and of others because you don't have the things you need. And honestly, what is life but to have the things that you need in your life and to be happy with that? I would get very depressed over the years because if I couldn't get a job that let me feel fulfilled and I was really bad at the jobs I could get, where was I supposed to go? Who was I supposed to be? How could I possibly maintain a situation where if I call out more than a small handful of times in a rolling six month period for health concerns, whether mental or physical, they'd start writing me up? What about two weeks or zero weeks of paid vacation a year? In this situation, Kai is submissive to the whims of Hal as he barks orders and chastises him. It's abuse. At Walmart and elsewhere, I was constantly in the position of doing basically anything to avoid getting fired. But they won't just fire you, they'll keep you on a long haul disciplinary track because being a less than ideal fit for their mundane work is better than training someone new. Writing people up just gives them an excuse to never give you a proper raise or increase in benefits. They can treat you as poorly as they want. They can make you feel like trash, not give you the tools you need to do your job, and then write you up for doing it poorly or not good enough. 
Jace empathized with his workers, like me, because there was no sense in slashing your own tires to motivate workers when corporate Walmart and so many other similar companies relied almost entirely on the stick to motivate workers versus the carrot. Weaver, the kind-hearted supervisor, admits he should have sent Kai on his way years ago, but hasn't. It's because he cares about him as a human. As you discover through this game, the real penalty of losing a ship is lost time and money, which the game threatens you about with repeated notes, but it doesn't actually take any actions about it. Like these companies, Lynx will do anything to degrade you just so long as you keep moving. Walmart repeatedly fired my coworkers on technicalities, especially when their car kept breaking down and they couldn't make it in on time, or at all, or they would get sick and have no time off to cover it, and their manager would just tell them to reapply in 30 days, or they'd have to apply at another Walmart after 30 days. This happened a lot. Around the time that Hard Space spins up the Kai drama, I was so clearly familiar with my routine breaking down ships that I felt pity for Weaver having to reteach Kai basic things about reactors when I was whipping them around left and right. I wondered to myself, empathizing with Weaver, what could a supervisor possibly teach Kai at this point to make him good at this job? And it seems he just isn't. It seems that's just his pace. It seems this is all he can do, and all he will ever be. It's all Kai has, and I've been there. I was there for a very long time. And of course, on the flip side, one of the biggest benefits of doing your job decently is that you get to do other people's work too. Hal Rhodes has never salvaged a ship in his entire career, but Lynx has sent him to watch over your team. He doesn't understand the work at all. At a point, he tries to calm everyone down with a yoga routine by shutting off your crew's thruster controls. He does this, of course, right as Lou is about to drift into a furnace. I'm drifting! You're not listening, Lou. In through the nose now. It's hot! It's hot! And out through the mouth. Hal is a sociopath. And I really feel like retail is not for the empathetic as far as being a middle management. It's not for the empathetic. It I sounds like not right just now. retail, but def there are definitely plenty of industries where it's like if you're just one or two hairs above the base of, of not being a sociopath. Yeah, yeah you have exactly. to be a sociopath. And it's like, yeah. I got to make the numbers go up, you know? Yeah. And that's what it comes out to. And, and that's the thing is you almost have to shut off a part of you caring about people to do those jobs. Like you have to like, man, I know that George has got like family of five, but you aren't getting the numbers, man. Yeah. Sorry, you're fired. Hal focuses on numbers. Numbers that can never be reached because he keeps moving the goal posts. But here's the thing. I'm looking at the reports, and this crew just still isn't quite hitting the targets. What are the targets? Well, they're higher than this. Hal is a master chef of compliment sandwiches. He praises you one minute, but turns a knife on you the very minute you're not meeting their expectations. He doesn't actually give a damn about what you do in your berth shift to shift because he doesn't know what the work is. Like a lot of retail management, Hal doesn't understand what the hell he's talking about. Hal can access your controls, flip things on and off, but he doesn't actually understand anything other than the sheer output on the other side. Yes, manager, please tell me more about how crappy I'm doing, when it's clear you haven't had to stack three pallets of 15 to 50 pound bags of dog food while your boss is breathing down your neck about some arbitrary pace you should be operating at. The pressure is always on, and managers like Hal will never tire of degrading you as their one tool to make you work faster. But something eventually has got to change, whether it's the employee or the employer. When it came to this review, I had to give it some space to speak on its own, as if I hadn't been playing it for over two years and was well used to many of the ship's layouts and mechanics. I have to admit that it was fun to understand so much about the game from the get-go, even if the gradual reintroduction of mechanics I was already familiar with was a bit pedantic. By focusing on completing the campaign, the feeling of tedium that had built up in my gut over the years stayed at bay, usually. But when people ask if this 15 minute shift to 15 minute shift thing is all there is to it, it's kind of a bummer to say, yeah, it is. If you don't think it's fun 15 minutes at a time, then you probably won't change your mind hours later. 
But if you can get over that hump and get used to the job, and I can't believe how much this would apply for any tedious, terrible job in the real world, it really is a lot of fun. Hard Space does a good job reminding you that however fun the job is, it is, well, a job. Of course, like any tedious entry-level work, there's going to come a time when the honeymoon is over in a more defined way. Like when you don't have anything more to learn, and with full grasp of what your duties are, you realize that you're kind of stuck. That's when the resentment fills in. That's when the boredom pops up. You start giving less of a crap, and then you really just start to hate your job. Hard space pushes those buttons, for better or worse. But if you stick with it, you'll come to a point where you'll always know where the base components of each ship are, or where they can be, and how to dismantle complex systems. You'll always know the eight points to cut to free an airlock, or how to dissect the nanocarbon carapace of a mackerel. You know exactly how you're going to dive in, and know exactly which tools you're going to use. Without an arrow to guide you, it falls on you to make all of the decisions, both mundane and vital, and craft a bespoke plan specifically made for each ship. When people complain, I'll call them critics, that quote-unquote low-skilled jobs don't call for a living wage, I know for a fact that those critics wouldn't survive doing that work without some effective on-the-job training and skill building. They don't understand how long it takes to do those kinds of jobs decently, much less well, much less be in a position to teach others. Flipping burgers doesn't require the training that writing professionally does, but I guarantee that few of those critics have any idea about how to step into a fast food kitchen and start flipping burgers, or stock shelves effectively, or operate a forklift. Remember, you have the flexibility here to pick the ships you want to work on. If you want to work on a bigger ship, there are a couple of those. If you want to work on a smaller ship, well, it's kind of just the mackerel. Do I wish there were two, three, or four more ship archetypes? You bet. Would I pay money for them? You bet. But there is a balancing act here. You can get very familiar with the base architecture of these ships, but sometimes the tedium does set in, like this one time I did three javelins in a row, and that wasn't great. Don't do that. But then you encounter stuff you just can't avoid, like stacks of soft crates that have to be plucked out one by one, and there are ships full of them. Clearing cockpits is a repetitive task of removing computers, storage, and chairs. Among the game's four archetypes, ships are still about 80 to 90% similar, which means there are big chunks of these jobs you can almost do blindfolded once you're familiar with their base layouts. When the tedium starts to settle in, the story works to facilitate some sense of progression. The story hinges on ranking up, which hinges on completing salvage goals, which hinges on not screwing around while salvaging ships and knowing your role and routine, for better and worse. You see, the game doesn't punish you for going nuts nuking ships haphazardly for funsies, but it also makes it kind of a pain in the butt to. There are no junk hulls that you can just blow up. These ships are too sturdy and the demo charges are too limited and rare, and each ship's outer shell is too impenetrable that it requires a good bit of work to get messy. It's like being thirsty, but the only thing you can drink is wrapped tightly on a pallet in the back of a semi-truck. It kind of makes me pine for the good old days of cheat codes so I could just split saw a ship to oblivion. As I recall, a very early version of this game lets you upgrade your cutter to cut through nanocarbon, which no doubt made gameplay pretty samey afterward. With the game's training and lack of rewards for screwing around, I felt constantly compelled to do my job the right way, to be obedient to my training and the routines I'd built out of necessity. Hard Space, like any other game, gets more fun as you play it correctly, consistently. Unlike a crappy job, you can't whip out a phone and screw off or chat with coworkers after a crappy customer. Your reward is the work, is the reward, is the work, and in that way, Lynx, this fictional mega corporation, dials itself right into your brain. But Hard Space gives you every reason to scale your abilities. The game's biggest ships beckon challengers. They're complex, have lots of stages, and until you have your speedrun routines figured out, require several shifts to break down. The game mercifully saves these for when you've built up a toolkit of skills. Although you have 30 certification ranks to earn, all the unlocks finish up at level 20, which is keyed to when the game's story finishes up. 
Outside the career, the daily race mode allows you to do different stuff that isn't just scrap the entire buffalo runs. This is where they moved the work orders of the early access version of the game, where you have a single shift to get on the high score leaderboard by salvaging specific components and otherwise salvaging as much as possible. There doesn't seem to be a lot of people playing this, at least on Xbox, because I did one run and placed in the top 100. There's one really cool idea that the game leaves on the kitchen counter and then doesn't serve to the player, and those are the ghost ships. They're weird ships that have been taken over by artificial intelligence out in the void, and you'll find their round and pill-like nodes attached to stuff throughout. They have a fun little scream when you destroy them too. But the final game doesn't seem to do much more with them than the early access version did. There's stuff in the emails about them, but since I put basically no effort towards reading them, that backstory may as well not exist. Aside from a few scripted lines when the game unlocks those ships, your crew doesn't talk about them, and they don't factor into the plot at all otherwise. There is no AI revolution, or something that progresses, or grows larger, or becomes more bad, or good. You don't dismantle these ships in different ways beyond zapping the additional nodes. The ships aren't afflicted by weirdness or whatever beyond some UI scrambling, so that's kind of a bummer. The story's rising action comes as a result of Hal cracking down on everyone. When his presence is forced upon the crew, he's a relatively benign presence. But as they begin to defy him, he begins cutting off their access to things, like Didi's comm line to family back home. He sees where their numbers are and wants the numbers to get bigger, and to that end, he starts bullying the workers, and even the calm and cool Weaver gets defensive. Lou's solution is to reach out to that previously mentioned Union. When Kai is disciplined by Hal, Kai regretfully turns over access to the Union newsletter Calm Group after Lou signals she's going to petition the Union for help. This causes Lynx to fire Lou, which seems like a relief, honestly. But then Lynx locks you down. The company executes on a clause from everyone's employment contract to take everything from them, like your ship, and your life, and your DNA, all in a goal to bust the workers of their will to resist and the union of any of its power. And the big deal here is, who's gonna stop Lynx? You signed a contract. You may not have read all the terms of it, but you laid down your virtual fingerprint and signed off. It's real. You are bound by it to the extent that it is enforceable. But companies can do basically anything they want. I remember when I was younger, thinking about how absolutely important a job was and how severe a disciplinary action or a firing was. What could you possibly do to cause that kind of interaction to occur? Because it would have been your fault. To lose your job felt a few shades shy of a death sentence. But justice is expensive. If you are fired under false pretenses and lose the sole means by which you can eat, afford shelter, and otherwise live, what are you gonna do? I've been fired a couple times, and at no point did I ever feel like I had any kind of recourse to get my job back, if I wanted it back, because of at-willed laws that persist here where employers can let you go for any reason. If you're fired from your job, are you gonna have the money for a lawyer? Of course not. The company gets away with it, and you stay fired. Across the country, individual Starbucks coffee shops are voting to unionize so that their workers can gain mutual protection as entire shops, rather than getting picked off individually by their massive parent corporation. And that's not to say anything about the increase in wages and additional benefits that unionization typically grants workers. And then Starbucks will close those unionized shops, like one in my own town, citing any possible reason to do so, like safety or profitability. Busting unions is illegal, but if the workers have fewer legal resources than the company that fired them, they have better odds of moving on than fighting for their old jobs. Add this up over and over across years and decades, and you can see why unions have had a tough time existing, much less growing, in America. Lynx banks on its easy ability to control you for its own benefit. As Hal becomes more irritated and clamps down further and further, you feel trapped. It feels scary in a way that's more invasive than the hazards you encounter, because those hazards can kill you, but your supervisors will always be there. You may be doing the same work mechanically, 15 minute shift to 15 minute shift, but it feels more claustrophobic in that suit as the rhetoric cranks up. It replicates the mundane evil of terrible jobs, because if your supervisors and managers give you hell, again, what are you gonna do? Not work there? Legally, you can't quit your job at Lynx. They have to fire you. And you can't be fired, so here you are. 
Hard Space sets up two endings, one where you deal with Lynx as a terrible employer, and one where you get to quit entirely. Behind the scenes, Weaver is working out industrial action, the game's one different mission I mentioned earlier. This one act will hopefully serve as a wedge to give your crew, and hopefully many, many more across the corporate empire, any kind of bargaining power. You can start this mission whenever you want, so if you have this intense drive to work off your still immense debt shift by shift on your own, you can do that. Industrial action gives you a gecko and turns off the shift clock so you can work without much impediment. What's going on now with the shift clock? Al, we need to talk. The shift starts like nearly any other, but it's clear that Weaver has worked out how to lock Hal out of his controls over you. He still gets through, seizing your suit periodically, but you have plenty of space and time to complete your goal. Destroy the hell out of this gecko. Your job is not salvage. Your job is to fail all of your salvage goals by destroying critical components and tossing tons of material in the wrong containers. I caused so much havoc on this ship, carving it down to almost atomic slices here and there, that the game really did begin to struggle. As Weaver and Hal battle for control over your birth, Hal becomes increasingly unhinged, showing his true sociopathy. I got the right to do whatever I want to you! You were nothing until Link found you! Obedience is success! You've chosen to cross the company that gave you a chance! We'll drive you to the ground with death! We'll give you work so dangerous you'll revive 20 times a day until your DNA comes apart at the seams! And when you come back as a useless, gibbering blob, we'll make your family pick up the bill! When you destroy that last salvage goal, Hal deletes Kai's data from the Lynx Everwork program as a lesson about consequences, a lesson that's supposed to haunt the team. Kai reveals that he's working with a reactor that's going critical near his furnace in another station. It goes off and you see the station ignite off in the background, and it's presumed that Kai is killed in the explosion, which spells out some truly terrible consequences for Hal. Kai lives because it would be a bit too dramatic for this story to kill someone, apparently, and Weaver sends you back to the safety of your Habs. The whole thing was recorded and sent through back channels out to the media, where Hal's meltdown spells some severe amounts of doom for Lynx, and the government finally intervenes on behalf of workers. Fittingly, CEO Calicia Rye Paulson and her family and the other executives of Lynx blame the administrators and get away scot-free. Hal goes back to back-breaking inventory work, which may be a fate worse than death for him, but the workers get their debt relieved to a far smaller, more realistic amount. This provides a pathway for you to break free of your servitude to this nefarious company. With Lynx humbled, you need only two things to turn in your employee card and set sail for the vast vacuous unknown. They didn't clear out all of your debt, but what remained here, which I don't know if it's variable based on how much work you did beforehand, was just a hair over $28 million. And they're dollars, not space credits or whatever. At this point in the game, you could knock that out with a single gecko salvage. You also need to get your ship ready to go, which meant combing through the selector to find out the ships with the parts I needed and then ripping those components out. Then tossing the rest of the ship away because who cares? I didn't need anything else. A couple of rounds of this and I had everything I needed to fix a Beulah and terminate my contract with Lynx. If you've ever left a job on your own terms, two weeks notice or not, it feels like you're getting your way. You feel powerful. It's how it should be. You should have the power to leave any job and move to another job without condescension, without unwanted financial penalty or existential dread, and hopefully with a little party. But maybe that's asking a little too much. You started here alone, and you finish here alone. Weaver finally retires, allowing Dee Dee to step into the role of your supervisor at no extra pay for those last couple rounds, or any amount of rounds you want. Maybe you just want to keep doing this. Lou even gets to come back, although I wonder how much debt she truly has at this point if you're the new guy and walking out the door now. Taking this on its face, these cutters just enjoy the work. While I'm demanding things, people should be able to do the thing that they enjoy in the place that they like going to with the people that they like working with, and go home not feeling dehumanized with an amount of money still in their bank accounts that they can maintain normal lives. And now, you're free. So do you keep playing? 
Do you tackle another difficulty? Do you load up on daily races? It's entirely up to you because you fought for this over the course of the campaign, and it's the most earnest feeling conclusion to a game I think I've ever played. I earned the right to not play this game anymore. I love Hard Space Shipbreaker because it's hecking fun. It's a hacking fun game. And I understand if it's 15 or 30 or 45 minute gameplay loop isn't for you. Even with its intentionally primitive ships and your confined berth, you can see how the designers found so long ago a balance between overwhelming the player with impossibly large ships and making you feel like you're in charge of the space. Logging the footage was a relative breeze because it was a lot of me doing the same stuff over and over again and finding the little different strands of gold and other precious metals in here that I had to make specific notes of. About. Even as this game and review have so much to say about the modern state of bad, tedious jobs that barely grant you your basic life necessities and the environments that create them, there's a genuine, maybe perverse joy in playing this game because of how it builds competency. Every game requires you to achieve a level of competence in playing it with its specific rules, but it's usually a means to an end. You learn a game's battle system and the layouts of its talent trees because you must inevitably destroy the game's big bad. In an immersive sim, something I've covered plenty of on this channel, achieving competence grants you the tools you need to experiment with the game's possibilities to accomplish goals. But in hard space, competence is the objective. I mean, yeah. There's still a narrative you can fulfill, there's a debt you can pay off, and those serve as points on the horizon to guide your ambitions toward. I fell in love with this game because I achieved competence. I could fade into the berth and see a gecko and know exactly what to look for and how to get my job done, even if I never got to speedrunning pacing. It's in the same way that a store employee can stare down three pallets of household cleaners and feel confident knowing exactly how their night is going to go. That confidence, that surety of habit, is what Hard Space wants you to feel. This isn't a game for everyone. The sixth off Newtonian physics space stuff is fine for us millennials who grew up with the scent and had a joystick firmly planted on our desktop, but I can see how it would be a turnoff for well, most anyone else. The game demands you learn this job, and once you do, you feel like you're actually accomplishing the job. There's something about this work that makes me wish there were more detailed statistics about how efficiently I tore apart ships or something that the game could use in to praise or scold me dynamically, like an awful job in the real world. Maybe I'm just a sadist, but maybe I want a game to pluck that string so well. I'm really not a lore guy, but I wish the game had more to say about the conditions that created this universe beyond the emails you can salvage. I wish you could engage with your crewmates in a more meaningful way, but the pathos is here. When the game strikes a chord just right, which it did quite a few times through this now completed campaign, it genuinely evoked something emotional in me. It brought me back to years and years and years of work that barely put food on the table and told me to be happy about it in a society that also told me to be happy about it. And not just me, but millions of others. I typically give up on games after reviews and I feel like I can safely put this game to bed after so many years. I've waited so, so long for this game to reach 1.0 so that I could finally give this full review and I'll be honest, I don't expect this video to get many views. I'm really putting this together as a passion project. By all means, Blackbird is done with this game. There is no battle pass coming, no new ships, no new content, no expansion set, no new stations, etc. They reached the finish line and went home, and I can't blame them. But after two and a half years, I'm done with it too. This is a job that, with notice as long as the span of this video, I can leave, and the game can forget me just as quickly as any corporation can. This is a game that will or won't convince you in its magic, in doing a job. There is a thread shared here between enjoying it for its ship carving in the game, and finding the joy in plucking items from a warehouse bin for a family's birthday party in an efficient manner in the real world. In my own small way, I just like to shine a light on how well hard space works and how hard it worked to get there. This is a game that I've loved for so, so long, and I'm glad I was able to use my channel and my format to be able to talk about it. You know what? Don't be a dick and be a good person. Let's just go ahead and say it the right way. Just don't be a dick. Understand people have, you know, feelings and thoughts and, and, and want to be heard and they want their 
you know, their opinion to matter and that they want to feel like they're impacting something greater than themselves sometimes and to understand that, listen to that. So that's it. Oh, hey there. We're at the end. I, uh, we've got a lot to cover. Hang on. I've got a sticky note with a bunch of stuff that I got to talk to you about. So funny thing that happens and be sure to stay tuned after this because we're doing that top 10 nth review, uh, hard space shipbreaker tips. So stick around, do that. Anyway, twist of fate in the time during the production of this video, I was actually laid off. And uh, that's kind of what's been happening to local newspapers across the country. Uh, it's trying to get back on its feet. I filed for unemployment. Uh, and I'll be doing a fundraiser soon to hopefully buffer me out a little bit. And it's giving me more time to do stuff like make this video, which came together pretty quick because I had a bunch of extra free time on my hands. So I've been kind of going in a bunch of different directions, hoping that uh, everything kind of works out. Uh, I have options. I have a lot more options now than I did nine months ago before I had this job when I was just doing all that crappy work. Um, gosh, uh, I want to talk about the next video, but there was something that I really needed to get on top of, but I totally forgot, but whatever. Maybe it'll um, come to me. Oh, I was going to make the remark. Um, I mentioned that links won't fire you in chapter four, I believe. And obviously they did, they fired Lou. So here's an in-video correction of this thing that I'm not going to correct at this point. Whatever. Thank you. Thank you for submitting it. Thank you for putting that content, comment in. Uh, I'm already acknowledging it. I'm going to tell you to watch this part of the video. Which you should be watching anyway because you're supporting, you know, the, the channel. So anyway, next video. I have reached out to virtually everyone from Giant Bomb and have heard basically nothing. And Fandom, who owns Giant Bomb now has basically said, yeah, we don't, we're not going to participate in any of this and we're not going to respond to your emails anymore. And that was after a month of trying to get their attention, all that stuff. So that's the next one. I'm going to try and get that one done. I'm going to finally get Giant Bomb done for number 20. That's the plan. So, uh, but otherwise, thank you so much to my producers over here, G-Man Lives, Lee Kenyon, Mitchell, Yahoo Silverman, Romega, Steve Brunwasser, Strupp, Thank you so much um, for being my producers up here, uh, supporting me. And you can leave tips, of course. You can see, hang on, the other way. I keep doing, I keep fucking that up. Uh, leave me a tip. Buy me a coffee. But check out the Patreon. Uh, if you'd like to contribute regularly and show up on this roster over here, you can do that. You can contribute on a regular basis. Um, and that will allow me more and more to be able to do this stuff quicker. So you're not waiting four months for every new video, which, you know, that's, that's the call of the universe. So, uh, again, at this point, if you haven't liked, if you haven't subscribed, get on this, get on the, the clicking and the bell and all that stuff and join discord. We've got an awesome discord. We have tons of fun in there. We talk about Minecraft, a game that we definitely don't play ever social media. I'm everywhere. And, um, yeah, links for everything else are below. So, with all that said, let's dive into the thing I did. Woo! You've made it this far, so let's get to the listicle portion of this review before you click away. These are 10 hot tips from the nth review on how best to salvage ships in this game based on my personal years of experience. So let's kick it off. Number one, use the jacks. If you get those long slabs of nanocarbon stuck on the divider between the furnace and the collector, something very common with the Atlas ships, tether them to the jacks. You can use them to pull those pieces aside, and with the new angle, you can tether them back into the processor where they belong. Number two, don't cut off those cockpits yet. You may be tempted to hack off those mackerel or javelin cockpits as you're annihilating cut points, but don't. Trying to salvage electronics and other internal goodies from a much smaller hull is a nightmare because they'll start spinning and become a pain to pull stuff out of. Keep those cockpits attached to the main hull. Yank everything out, then hack it off and send it on its way. Number three, upgrade your oxygen ASAP. 
The more oxygen you have, the less irritating it is to have to run back to the master jack to refill it as quickly. Number four, shut off any fuel. Whenever you find a fuel valve, shut that thing off. Any stray split saw blast is going to start a fire and it will spread a lot quicker than you think. Find all those levers early on and shut them off. Number five, yank the electronics. When you need particular components like wires and stuff for Beulah, your transport ship, spare yourself the electronic damage and yank those components off the hull before you scrap them. If you try to scrap them first, you may end up dead by electricity. Be careful. Number six, use the split saw on connect points. I know I talked about it earlier, but when you're cutting up the outer shell, it's so much faster to use the split saw on those yellow cut points than it is to slowly laser them apart. Besides, you can't cut through the nanocarbon anyway. Number seven, salvage airlock panels, not lights. There are lots of small, small things that you'll find in these ships, and it's very easy to get lost in the weeds trying to sort out every last item. So here's a tip, those airlock control panels are worth something. The lights are not. Those individual lights can go to hell for all you should care. Number eight, throw away bad ships. There's no penalty in ditching a ship for a new one and plenty of potential penalty for starting a new shift when there's little left in the berth. If you make a mistake, if a reactor goes critical, if there's not enough salvage left in the berth to cover your shift fees, ditch that ship and start on a new one. Number nine, burn ships for Beulah. Adding on to number eight, and as I mentioned at the end of the campaign, if you only need one or two or three components from a ship for your own personal transport, feel free to rush in, scavenge what you need, and then load another ship. Don't think you need to disassemble an entirely new ship for just a couple random pieces you need. Finally, number 10, make big holes. You may be tempted to try and fish out big computer consoles and tables and chair benches through a ship's small portholes. Don't waste your time. Use that split saw and make a big opening and toss stuff right out of there. That's what those tools are there for. Have fun, cutters.